Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our study on the line simply presented. And uh, we're going to be going through these uh, papers that Parminder did back in 2015. And um, just establishing how the lines were understood then. And um, then as we go through these next few studies, we're going to really establish what we've learned about the lines and how to put these lines together. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have here this afternoon. And we invite your Holy Spirit to guide and direct in these studies. Help us to understand the things that we present and uh, to be able, help me to be able to put these in a simple form. I pray for those who are watching these studies that they can be blessed and that your angels can watch over them, and that your Holy Spirit can lead them. And uh, we pray for this movement, for the things that you are teaching us, and for the way that you are leading us individually, and bringing us together as a group to accomplish um, the tasks that you have given us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we looked at these um, a while ago. And um, uh, so I, I had sent out these, these reform lines, and there is four of them. So Parminder had done these four studies in 2015 at the Alberta camp meeting. Um, I think he did it in more than four studies, but he had four papers that he went through. And uh, these were uh, the beginning of ancient Israel, the end of ancient Israel, the beginning of modern Israel and the end of modern Israel. Now, these lay out the lines as we understood them in 2015. And at that time, Parminder is just presenting what we understand. It's done in an organized fashion. Um, we had at that time understood already that the, the second angel arrived at 9-11. It wasn't just an empowerment of it. So you'll see that in these studies. And... Um, these these understanding of the lines we've we've sort of simplified them over time that is we left out some of the details that are still in how they presented the lines at the time and so we're going to draw out these lines and then we're going to go through each one of them so we're going to have our basic line um and um now I've always drawn it out a little bit differently as far as um, some of the, the symbols. Everybody kind of has their own way of doing this. Now, um, and I have these lines sort of drawn out here. Um, so I'm going to look at what I have here on, on this chart. First, we'll, we'll actually draw them out as well. Um, so um, what you see here is uh, these, this is um, the line of the decrees and this is the line of the three angels messages. And um, the three decrees, um, like the three angels messages basically follow the same idea here. This just is another diagram that's a little bit better and that you will see represented in these lines. That is you'll have a period of darkness you'll have a time of the end and the first message will arrive at that time and then there's going to be a formalization of that message and and then you would have um, the empowerment of that message along with that where there would be the laying of the foundation and the work of the enemies and then the second message would arrive and there would be a tarrying time and, and this one here, you're going to see I have the prediction before midnight and some other things in here which don't really make sense, but um, that's because there's two different lines here that we don't recognize. Um, but then we're going to have the second angel formalized, and then we're going to have uh, the second angel empowered, and then we're going to have the Sunday law. So when I drew this out, I was this is like a working sheet that I had, so you can kind of ignore some of that. Now, you can see this in the line below, 
this is the line um, at the end of, uh, or well, the end of the 2300 days. And this is the line which would be the beginning of modern Israel. So Parminder doesn't address these lines of the decrees. Um, he's going to be addressing uh, the beginning of ancient Israel, the end of ancient Israel. And he's not going to mark this as the end of ancient Israel or the beginning. Right. So so this line here, I don't think was well understood in 2015. It wasn't really addressed. And it was sort of developing at that time. We developed it a bit more in 2016, though we were starting to work on it, uh, dealing with uh, the seven kings, the first seven kings of Persia. Uh, but this line here, of course, is the main template that we have. So you can see clearly here the time of the end, the formalization, the foundation, then the work of the enemies, then the second angel arrives, the tearing, the formalization, the empowerment. And here we have also this revival in there. And then you're going to have the third angel's message arrive. And then you're going to have some other things. There's going to be, of course, the disappointment. And um, the number seven is going to be represented there. So sometimes we will put um, uh, symbols dealing with angels coming down. Um, you know, basically, anytime you have an angel arrive, an angel's coming down, which represents a message. But this is the basic idea that we would have had in. Uh, 2015. And so when we go through these, we will see, uh, and we're going to go through them fairly quickly. We're just going to see, um, and, and we know that there are differences. That is, um, how Parminder understood the lines and how Jeff understood the lines back at that time and how this movement did. Um, as we receive more understanding of the lines, um, we're going to uh, develop up this further. And, um, and also in 2015, uh, the idea of midnight and the midnight cry hadn't really been separated out yet. Um, we were just starting to understand midnight in 2015, later in 2015. And then in 2016, it became one of our waymarks. So, so this is prior to that. So we can see he has this reform line, which he calls the reform line of Moses. Now, I would say um, to say that the reform line of Moses is this reform line. Um, you know, when we start look, when we started looking at in our morning studies, going through these lines, uh, what did we find about? Um, we found this in the lines of Abraham, but particularly in the line of Moses. What did we find, if anybody remembers? What, what was it that we noticed as we began going through the Exodus story? Were the lines as simple as this? And, and if they weren't, what was making them complex? Anybody remember? So one thing we noticed is that there were multiple lines and it wasn't as straightforward as these early analysis of the Exodus uh, were. So one is you, you have Moses, and then you're going to have Joshua, and, and Moses has his own personal reform line, just as Miller does. And... So when we looked at these lines originally, we hadn't recognized that sometimes our understanding of the lines was really looking at a few different lines and mixing them together. Because we, we didn't clearly know how to distinguish what line we were on. So the way that we would have looked at it, you know, 10 years ago, uh, for instance, um, if you go back to 2010, uh, when Jeff had the prophetic chain, he wouldn't have seen that there is multiple reform lines, that each way mark can itself become a reform line. This is something that's fairly recent, though it has been developing. Um, 
ever since the School of the Prophets began in 2014 when we introduced fractals. But it was unclear once we introduced fractals, it was unclear how those affected the lines. And um, so we, we figured out ways to address it uh, that weren't always accurate. So we had these ideas of staggered lines. Uh, we created lines and Parminder eventually created lines that looked nothing like Millerite history in our time. And, and, and so we were just seeing these all as a part of this sort of line um, that was, you know, the priests, the Levites, the Nethanim, the 144,000. Parminder had developed it in 2018. So three years later, his lines are going to look quite a bit different than what he had here. But in 2015, we can see we have a period of darkness caused by a mystery of iniquity. So he's going to look at um, that there is a, a sin that is here. So some particular um, uh, error or sin or darkness that then is going to be addressed. And here he has this mis mystery of iniquity is the mis mixing of seed, right? Now, of course, this also occurs in other lines, it deals with um, the line of Noah as well. But they were um, the purity of this line, that is the, the line of Christ was could have been obscured because the children of Israel uh, we're mixing with these, these nations. And then you're going to have the time of the end. So in this line, we looked at this before, so we're just going to skip through it. We have the angel arriving, time of the end. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. So those prophecies are the fourth generation, the 400 years, and, and, and also the 430 years, though it's not specifically mentioned as a prophecy. And then you're going to have this increase of knowledge, and this is going to be Moses in his childhood. And he also calls it the unsealing of the message. So we can see how that would relate to the message of Daniel being unsealed in Millerite history. And so he's going to go through this various uh, things that happened to him that are all a part of the increase of knowledge. And then we're going to have a formalization of the message. And they place this at the burning bush. This is what Jeff had done. And then they're going to have circumcision as the empowerment of that message. Now, um, so when they address these formalization empowerment, um, there is a lot of detail that's being left out. And, and we would look at these lines a little bit differently now, um, that we would see that there is, Way marks that occur in Moses' line, um, in his own personal line, and way marks which occur in um, the Exodus story itself. And we never did really refine those at this point. We just know that when we were looking at them, we were looking at different lines. And then we have the first message, empowered. That's going to be circumcision in the way that these lines were drawn out back in 2015. And then we're going to have the foundations are laid. That's in this case is going to be the Sabbath. And then you're going to have the work of the enemies. So there are the activities of the enemies he has here. And that's going to be in response to the Sabbath uh, uh, message. Now, part of the problem here. I mean, we have the foundations are laid. That is, this is the Sabbath. So this is going to be um, in connection with the giving of the manna um, when they're going to start uh, collecting the manna for six days. And then uh, on the sixth day, they're going to get a double portion and then they're not going to collect it on the Sabbath. Um, so these things are going to be happening here. And, and then Pharaoh is going to respond to that. So that's how they would have seen it then. And then the second message arrives, and this is going to be the serpents. And this is a marking of rejection of truth, he says. It's a type of the second angel's message. And um, then we're going to have the message empowered. So, so when we look at this, we see the second message arrives, 
But then we have this empowerment of the message. Where is the formalization? You know, it's, it's not there in how he's setting out this line. And then you have the second message empowered with um, these plagues. And then the third message arrives. This is going to be the judgment. It's going to be the 10th and last plague. And um, so that's going to be uh, obviously that Passover, or the Passover lamb. And then you're going to have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right? So you, now this is... Um, so this, there's a little bit of problems here. What would be the problem here? I mean, we know that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is actually a commemorative feast. So what? why does it occur? So they don't really have a Feast of Unleavened Bread in this story, right? How does it develop? Why do they have this commemorative feast? What occurs? There's a... A phrase called the bread of haste that's mentioned, I think it's maybe of the Psalms. So they're basically, um, they don't have time for the for the, the bread to be leavened. So they're making bread quickly. So it's unleavened. In a sense, they're just getting it ready and, uh, and they're moving quickly. In a sense, <laughs> Yeah, so it's because they they because they they couldn't prepare it properly, and so they end up with this unleavened bread, and so they're going to have a feast to commemorate that, but they don't actually have a feast of unleavened bread when they first leave Egypt, right? So they so they're not keeping a feast of unleavened bread, but it yeah. is going to uh, show up later. So. Um, and whether it is actually seven things, it doesn't appear to be. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe they do have unleavened bread. Maybe it's kind of like a feast, but it's not really. It is something that's going to be commem commemorated. But right. I and, think, and I think I did... was, the Passover, could you say that was like a feast at that their time? Well, they're going to have the Passover meal, right? So that's going to be on the 14th. And they're going to leave on the 15th when the Feast of Unleavened Bread would occur. And so it's that's when, they, of course, they're making this bread that now is unleavened. So that's why the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th. It, it begins on the day that they actually leave Egypt, right? Because they don't leave Egypt on the 14th. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they they and we've studied through the Passover and and I've said many times I've actually had at one time or another I've held every opinion possible when it comes to how the Passover is laid out uh, both in the Exodus and in the time of Christ. So I mean originally it was a Wednesday crucifixion uh, theorist uh, back before I was an Adventist. Um. So I know all these different views and understandings because I've held them at different times. But um, uh, we've taken the position based on study that uh, they begin the Passover on the when the 14th begins. That's when they're going to slay the Passover lamb. Uh, they're not supposed to leave their house until morning. And after they leave their house in the morning, they're then going to spoil the Egyptians. Uh, so that's during the day on the 14th. Then they're going to gather it. Um, um, the name of the place escapes me. Um, what's the name of the place? Goshen, right? Uh, Ramses, right? So they're in the land of Goshen. They're going to get back. To Ramses, however you say it. And then they're going to leave on the, on the morning of the 15th um, prior to sunrise, according to the spirit of prophecy. So, so they're going to leave on the 15th with a high hand. So this, this view is, is not the most common view uh, for the story of the Exodus. Uh, it's not the Jewish view, at least the rabbinic Jews. 
don't hold to that view. They hold the view that everything uh, happens on the 15th, basically the Passover lamb slain on the 14th at three in the afternoon, and they're going to eat it. And then, you know, the, the Passover occurs on the 15th. So, so it's a different view. But anyway, um, then we have the disappointment, and, and they had it there in 2015 as the Red Sea. And then we have the fourth angel arrive. Uh, that's going to be the tab Sabbath test through the manna, right? So I was saying the other one was through the manna, but that's actually going to be um, – that test is – the first one mentioned there is actually just about um, – that on the Sabbath they're gonna, they're, they're not gonna want to be working on the Sabbath. So, uh, so this is the manna one. Fourth angel arrives. We have the Sabbath test through the manna, and then we're gonna have um, the fourth angel really arrives at the second. So, uh, so it's it's kind of uh, the way that this they lay this out. I would have laid it out differently, but it's the second angel. So there's the first angel arrives that's part of the fourth angel arriving. And then you have the second angel, which is the fourth angel. So I don't think it's it's well expressed there. It's not very clear what they're doing there with that. And then you're going to have the third, the, the third angel arrive. So they're going to deal with that as the golden calf. So, um, so I think there are some things about this line, which um, I'm going to want to correct. Uh, at some point. Now, when we dealt with these lines, I'm just going to go here on these other charts. So we, we had worked these out. And I'm just going to show you what I have here, some of the old lines, how I would drawn them out in the past. Um, so you're going to see uh, the birth of Moses, the signs, the tenth plague. This is how he is laying it out. And then the manna, um, and then the second is um, what he had for the second was. Uh, let's go look at this again. Yeah, so he had that as Pentecost, right? And then you're going to have uh, the golden calf. Right. So the Pentecost, that's the receiving of the law. That's how they would have understood it. So, oh, yeah, and I have it right there, Pentecost, right, right above there. So, so this is how we understood it. We know that there's problems because Pentecost is not the day that the law is given. And... Then when we drew this out before, so I'm going to have to go way, way down. I have a lot of charts. That's what line, our line, literal Israel. So we had these lines and um, we had literal Israel, Canaan. We've worked through these lines a bit. We haven't come to solid conclusions on them. Uh, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Noah, the floodwaters, and I line Miller's line, Millerite history. There it is, Moses' line. So we had uh, Moses' line. And we didn't really finish this here. This one's not the right one. Here it is. So we have Miller's lines, Moses' line, and the Exodus line. So the way that we were looking at these lines is that Moses has this personal line, and it's part of the Exodus line. And if you look at our Exodus line, we're going to have the Red Sea as the third angel arriving. So this line is quite a bit different than the line... Um, that Jeff had created in the past. So how do we address the fact that our line, as we worked it out, is different? 
Are we saying that Jeff is wrong? What are we saying when we draw a line like this? Well, we, we would say this is line is the beginning of ancient Israel. At least it would be part of it. It's different than the line that Jeff had. Parminder's just really drawing out Jeff's line in 2015. So why is our line different? Does it mean that Jeff's line is incorrect? What, what's, what is it about Jeff's line that's different? Why is our line different? Well, um, Jeff was having a more broader picture. He wasn't maybe scaling things down. Okay. So, now, um, he, well, we could say he's mixing lines together. Right. So, I mean, because in our line here, we don't have um, the circumcision. Um, we have the plagues and the Passover. But in Parminder, when he drew this out, uh, the plagues were what? What was he marking in his line? Was that the second angel in part? Yeah, so when he was doing this, he's going to go through and he's going to have the second angel is arriving as the serpents, right? And then he's going to have the plagues as the empowerment of the second angel, right? And then the tenth angel is going to be the third angel or the tenth plague is going to be the third angel arriving. But we have it here as the second angel arriving. So... So we can say, well, somebody is, is in a different magnification. Now, I think that, that they're actually kind of mixing lines together is the way that I look at it. Um, but when we tried to work this out on our own, this is what we came up with. And that is the exodus is marking them crossing the Red Sea. That's going to be the third angel arriving. I mean, that's when they're out of, you know, they've conquered Egypt, so to speak. You know, the Pharaoh is going to be killed. Um, and this, this makes a much more logical line, but it also is more consistent with the idea of how we look at the lines above, right? And that line above um, when we look at it here, I gotta switch this. Right, so we have the line above as um, I have that. That's Miller. So we have this cosmic line, and we're gonna have literal Israel, and then we're gonna have um, uh, Moses line, to Exodus line, but we don't have. Yeah, so we have these other lines. So we're going to have Egypt to the promised land. So here you're going to see the Red Sea is going to be the second angel arriving. So what we have to define with these lines, you know, say this is a study on the lines simply presented. But what I'm showing you here is that there are different lines that occur and that it's the line above that we can zoom into a way mark on a line above and we would then have that line and i would say that the line that we had of them coming out of egypt that ended with the red sea is actually a, a zoom into this line because this line is going to address egypt to the promised land that's a bigger line right that line egypt to the promised land is a bigger line 
then is uh, the line just going from uh, Moses' birth to the Red Sea. So we haven't defined all of these lines yet because we've been focusing mostly upon the period of the judges in our morning study, but we're going to come back to these as time goes on. We're going to define these lines much better. Um, so those are, the, those are some of the issues that have arisen with these lines. So now we're going to look at the end of ancient Israel, and we're going to have some similar problems that we have with the beginning of ancient Israel. Now, remember, we have our main uh, template, our main model of these lines is Millerite history. And uh, the thing that's interesting about, uh, about that line of, of Millerite history is it so well matches um, the line of the decrees, the three decrees. And yet, at this time, we had addressed the line of the three decrees, as which starts the 2300 days, as a parallel to uh, the three angels' messages that end the 2300 days. We were just beginning to look at that history in early 2015. Um, they were studying, they started studying, um, I think it was early 2015. I know by 2016, we had at least developed it to some degree. And, and I know um, in 2015, there was uh, some discussion regarding it, but I don't, I can't remember exactly when we laid out the line of the three decrees. I mean, we might have had them as a line, but even, even a bit earlier, it's possible. I'm trying to remember if we even had that, but they would have looked quite different. So now the end of ancient Israel. Um, now this is the reform line of Christ. At least that's how it's, it's titled. But again, there's so many reform lines that are occurring in this history um, that we sometimes get a little bit confused, especially later when we start placing midnight in there. Um, and that was part of the problem. Once we had midnight and the midnight cry, um, when we started to examine these lines that we had established previously, um, we weren't really sure what to do with them. But here we're going to have a period of darkness. And of course, of course, we know the people that dwelt in darkness uh, saw a great light. We can see here there's a parallel to the story of Moses uh, with the children. So we know in the story of Moses, you have the children that are being uh, killed when they're Born, and you're going to have this parallel in the time of Christ. So you can see the parallel between Moses and Christ. Now, the mystery of iniquity here is the influence of Greek education and Roman decadence. Um, now, this is an interesting point. Um, and, and, it, and it's partially true, but it's, it's, it, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, were the Jews studying Greek education? Were they studying Greek at this time, in the time of Christ? I think they were heavily influenced by Greek. Okay, they're influenced, but they're not studying Greek. That is, they're, they consider it pagan. They have separated themselves from the nations around them. They have become exclusive. So they aren't studying Greek. The Jews in Jerusalem don't know how to speak Greek. They're definitely not studying the, the Greek writings. But they are influenced because they hear it. And uh, they introduce a type of um, a response. Let's put it that way. To Greek thought. And, and, and what they are doing is they're entering onto that ground just even to defend uh, um, Jewish ideas in that environment of Greek thought, because it's everywhere. Um, they develop their own system that really, in some ways, parallels Greek thought. 
but it's not because they're studying the Greek philosophers. It's really a type of Hebrew philosophy, but it's influenced by the Greeks. Um, and Alfred Edersheim in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he writes a really good paragraph regarding that, how it's it's just even within the, the person themselves, they're trying to defend their beliefs in this environment. And we can see a similar thing that happened within Adventism, you know, being called a cult and how we try to, uh, you know, not be seen as a cult. And it's, we, we end up on the enemy's ground. And, and so this is what, what happens. So we can see this here um, uh, in this quote from uh, the Spirit of Prophecy. In the days of Christ, the town or city that did not provide the religious instruction of the young was regarded as under the curse of God. Yet the teaching had become formal. Tradition had a great, in a great degree supplanted the scriptures. True education would lead the youth to seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him. But the Jewish teachers gave their attention to matters of ceremony. The mind was crowded with material that was worthless to the learner that would not be recognized in the higher school of the courts above. The experience which was obtained through a personal acceptance of God's word had no place in the educational system. Absorbed in the round of, the, of externals, the students found no quiet hours to spend with God. They did not hear his voice speaking to the heart. In their search after knowledge, uh, they turned away from the source of wisdom. The great essentials of the service of God were neglected, the principles of the law were obscured, and that which was regarded as superior education was the greatest hindrance to real development. Under the training of the rabbis, the power of the youth were repressed, powers of the youth. The minds became cramped and narrow. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. So the Jews weren't teaching Greek thought, but they were teaching something to sort of counter what they believed was happening. And this was this formal, traditional view. That is, they had become exclusive and formal. So the teaching was based upon passing down the wisdom of the rabbis. So the rabbinical schools were based upon tradition. It wasn't teaching people to study the word of God for themselves. So that's, that's what they put as the darkness. But... And, and I think that's partially true, but we know that they were legalistic in their approach to the Ten Commandments and to the law of God. They had added all of these traditions, and they were exclusive. They weren't having contact with the nations around them. They weren't a light to lighten the Gentiles. Um, so now we're going to have Christ and, of course, John the Baptist uh, born. John the Baptist first, then Christ six months later. And, and that's going to mark the time of the end. And then we have uh, this increase of knowledge, right? So that's going to be the birth and childhood of Jesus. And then we have John the Baptist ministry. They have as the formalization of the message. And then the baptism of Jesus is the first angel empowered. And then we're going to have a second angel arrive, a second message, um, after the foundations are laid and the activities of the enemy. So the second message they have is the cleansing of the temple. This is the first cleansing of the temple. And then they're going to have um, the, uh, the disappointment that they're marking as the death of John the Baptist and Lazarus. And, and then we're going to have, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember what, what, yeah. So the tearing time, they have Jesus tarries for Lazarus. And 
of course, we know that as we, we move through these, we're going to have the triumphal entry. Now, the triumphal entry, uh, what does Ellen White compare it to? The Midnight Cry. Yeah, the Midnight Cry. And so we can see why we chose uh, to put the second message being empowered as, as the triumphal entry, because Ellen White parallels these two. Um, and now, of course, you can see, again, we don't have midnight in here, right? And then we have... Um, <clears throat> The third angel is going to arrive. That's going to be, they have all these things, the second temple cleansing, all these different things that go on. Um, and then you're going to have the message, third message arrives. That's judgment. That's the Passover and the cross. Right. And then you're going to have the disappointment of disciples. So that's going to be parallel to the disappointment of the Millerites. And of course, you know, that makes sense. And then we have um, the fourth angel arrival with the first. Jesus descends from heaven on Resurrection Sunday. Um, and we have Pentecost. So they're lining that up, of course, with um, um, what we saw in... Uh, I'm trying to remember how they did that. Anyway, that's going to be parallel to the fourth angel arriving, Pentecost, and then the close of probation. So we had Pentecost there as well. So that's going to be dealing with the golden calf, right? Um, the close of probation. So this is the Pentecost that they have with the giving of the law, these parallel. And so you can see the logic of these lines. Now, I would have these lines a little bit differently. So where, where would I put um, the crucifixion of Christ in a line and why? Now well, we know, that, yep, what's that? Well, sometimes we can put it in the, as the lining up with the, um, the third angel message arriving. Yeah, uh, which is what we do here. Or uh, we could place it, uh, as you did earlier on, with Passover at the middle of Waymark, with the, um, the midpoint. The midpoint, right. So it becomes, so that means that's a bigger line where you're zoomed out, right? Yes. So the cross of Christ can be uh, midnight. So, yes. so and, and that was part of the problem is because when we start looking closely at the symbols that are occurring in the story of Christ, we, we, we must recognize that there are different lines. That is, we must have a main line, and then we're going to have these uh, other lines that are zooming into these way marks. So we we haven't defined these yet. We haven't laid out this line of Christ um, to understand it. Now, one of the things that we see in that that had wasn't understood is that there is after the third message arrives. So you have your main reform line, and you have your third message arrive. Uh, you're going to have your first generation. And that first generation is, is going to have a falling away. And we would look at um, the close of probation, the end of Daniel's 70th week, I would say is actually the close of, that would be the third angel's message arriving. Right? So the 70th week, if you take that 70th week, uh, the cross becomes the center of that. And with the close of probation, that would be what parallels um, 
in, in, in the main line there. That would be what parallels October 22, 1844. But we also know that there is a parallel between the disappointment of the disciples and the disappointment of the Millerites. But we know in the Millerite history, there's two disappointments, is there not? What we call the first disappointment and the great disappointment. Mm -hmm. So we could have the disappointment of the disciples line up with the first disappointment. That's one way we could do it. So, so we again, we haven't drawn out these lines. We haven't defined them well yet. But what we know from what we have studied in the lines, in the morning studies for, you know, a uh, year and a third, I guess, um, that these lines are more complicated than we had made them out to be. That is, there is multiple lines. And if we're going to present these to people and if we're going to understand them, we need to know how to construct them. We need to know how to recognize what the main line is and uh, when we're looking at a waymark, we need to define what events and dates and what, what those messages are that are conveyed in that waymark when we draw it out as a line. And so we haven't done that with the line of Christ. Now, there also was, uh, in the past, two different um, ways that we understood that history. And one is there was seen what we called the line of Christ, which was actually different than this line. That is, there was a line that they understood. Um, and I had Tabo present it one time because um, I wanted to understand it. It, it didn't really help me uh, watching his presentation, but because um, he got a little bit confused over what, how the line was to be constructed. And so that's one thing I do want to look at again is how we look at that line of Christ. So we come to the end of Daniel's 70th week. That's going to be the end of ancient Israel. <clears throat> so I just want to review this a little bit on the whiteboard and um, try to see what, what it is that was that, that we learned as we went through this. Oh. And I have to stop sharing the screen. That should be okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, look at what's that? Uh, no, nothing. Just it okay. needs to go up just a little bit, I think. What's that? Your view, the view on the camera. What about it? Oh, never mind. I I'm sorry. I I'm looking from a smaller screen, and it looks weird. Okay. So we're going to have a line over here. So we're going to call this literal Israel. Okay. Now we have the beginning over here. And here we have the end. Now, in order to have literal Israel as a line and to have the beginning and the end, we know that this beginning is going to have these three way marks, the first, the second, and the third, however we define this. But this is, um, this literal Israel is a way mark on a bigger line. Now, this end of Israel is also going to have 
three way marks. But these reform lines exist on a line that has seven different way marks. That is, this reform line here, the way that we understood these prophetic chains is we would just put all of these different lines, reform lines, and we would just chain them all together. And so we would say, well, you're going to have uh, the exodus. You're going to have, um, you know, the crossing of the Jordan. So you're going to have you know, Moses and Joshua. You're going to have the period of the judges. You're going to have uh, Samuel. You're going to have Saul, David and Solomon. Those are going to be a reform line. So United Israel. And then you're going to have a, a reform line that deals with um you know, there's lots of reform lines, right? You have Hose Hezekiah has a reform line. Um, um, there's a reform line in the time of Josiah, right? So what we haven't done is we haven't really laid out how do we decide what a major reform line is? And that when we have a reform line, what way mark it is that we're zooming into. So even in this history, we know Moses has a reform line. You know, what we're saying here is that there's a reform line for Moses. There's a reform line for the crossing of the Red Sea, right? And because they're going to cross the Red Sea, um, you know, there's we're going to have the history of J J uh, Joshua in there. So how are we going to define that? That's going to be what we're going to examine. Um, at least in, in as simple a way as we can without going into lots of detail. That is, we're not going to be able in this study to go through all of the reform lines and lay them out. Uh, we're just going to present the, the basic idea of how we lay out these reform lines. Now, what would be one way we recognize a major reform line? Like, would we take, and, and this is kind of a trick question, but would we take the reform line of Hezekiah and say that that's a major reform line? So when Hezekiah is going to, um, in what's called the first year of his reign, he's going to cleanse the temple, uh, eight days for the priests cleansing the temple and eight days for the Levites cleansing the outer court. Right. And then they're going to have a Passover in the second month. They're going to invite um, uh, northern Israel to this Passover. Do we mark that as a major reform line? We don't No. Okay. So why is it not a major reform line? What reform line is it a part of? I mean, it must if it's a reform line. It has to be a way mark on some other reform line. Or does it? Can we just create reform lines that aren't um, zooming into a way mark? Mm. That's why I said it's kind of a trick question. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really have the words to uh, define at the moment. I don't have a thing about it. Okay. So we know that this reform line of Hezekiah comes in connection with the destruction of Samaria, right? That is, he's yeah. going to make an invitation to northern Israel, which includes Samaria, you know, two years before the captivity of of Hoshea, mm -hmm. right? And and then, you know, two years later, Samaria is going to be destroyed, right, in 721. So um, so we have this, this reform line, the reform line of Hezekiah, occurring in connection with this. 
Now, when we look at at this this dealing with Hoshea, it is in connection with what? The start of the twenty five twenty. Yeah, so it's addressing the twenty five twenty, right? So it's addressing the beginning of a time prophecy that's going to end in seventeen ninety eight, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we we could also say you know it's 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 near the beginning of this prophetic mirror. Um, but you know, how does the twenty five twenty fit into? Because we know that we would say the three decrees are a major reform line, but they're going to be addressing the start of the 2300 days. Yes. Okay. And we do have a major, what well, we do have a reform in the time of Josiah as well. And it's also connected to a time prophecy, you know, that's given at the dividing of the kingdom, right? So what we do know is that we have all of these reform lines, that they are connected, that they don't just happen out of nowhere, that they're connected to other reform lines. And we haven't really defined how we can recognize that it's a major reform line or not. That is, we know that we have one overarching reform line. That's from Eden lost to Eden restored right from the creation of the heavens and earth to the new heavens and earth that's our major yeah, we call it the cosmic line yeah the cosmic line right so so we have and then we know that we have seven major uh reform lines that we would call major reform lines but within those major reform lines they're fairly broad they cover one is called literal israel so you know, part of the problem is, you know, what do we mean by a major reform line? Um, you know, I would say that every reform line is a part of something else. It doesn't just exist on its own. But when we start talking about major and minor, those can be relative. So the reform line of Hezekiah is at least a few steps down from the cosmic line, but we must have a way of showing that, right? So we haven't worked these things out in detail yet, but we have to. Yes, but it's a process of time. Yeah, and it's gonna take time. It's not gonna be done, you know, in this series of studies here. But I want people to see that when we talk about these reform lines, the reasons the differences exist between what we were presenting in 2015 and before when we were dealing with reform lines and what we're understanding now is because we recognize that multiple reform lines exist within a story and that we need to recognize what the main overarching reform line of that waymark is because it's a waymark that exists on a line above it. Hopefully that makes sense to people, you know, anybody watching this, that we can see that this idea of a, um, a zoom into a line, what we call a fractal, is, is a part of a structure, that these bigger structures exist. And, and if you're looking at a reform line, you need to know what way mark that reform line is. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's I think one of the main things that we've learned over the past year and a bit is that that we can now understand what a reform line is, where it should be placed, or at least that it needs to be placed in some way that's connected. So one of the things that we see in Parminder study that's important is this period of darkness and these three messages. But when we look at a period of darkness, that darkness exists within reform lines. Reform lines have darkness all through them because we live in this world of sin. And the, those reform lines are not 
complete. Just because we have a reform line and we come to the end of the reform line, there is some reformation that occurs. You know, sometimes it's, uh, we could say some of them are dispensational. That is, they mark a new dispensation. That is a change in the ministration of Christ. And, and that's one thing we have to look at a little bit more in detail, how we understand that. Because, you know, the sanctuary, you know, we first start with, you know, altars, right? And then, you know, we're going to move to uh, the promised seed, um, you know, um, being divided and, and this kingdom set up. So all of these different dispensations prior to the flood, after the flood, um, once you set up a priesthood, um, these we haven't really addressed. And there's also covenant aspects of each of these reform lines and how they relate to these dispensations. And that's not to be confused with dispensationalism, which has to do with different ways of salvation. Um, they, they've taken that term and, and misapplied it and used it in a different way than we do. So, so that's where we're, we're going in the next few weeks to just kind of get this established a little more clearly. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. And thank you for the study this afternoon. Bless each person who watches these videos that, may, that they may come to a deeper knowledge of you and that you may come close to them. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.